This talk has come about because the publishing company Peter Owen has brought out a new edition of Ithel Cahoon's first novel, Goose of Homogenes. The new no edition includes the suite of illustrations that she made for the book, which were never used, probably for reasons of cost. And there's a chapter which formed part of her original plan, but which was not used either, probably for reasons of taste. So the new edition is closer to her original intentions than the first edition. Tonight I shall explain the context in which Cahoon wrote the book and I shall identify some of the main themes that run through it. I shall also ask how far is it autobiographical? When you read the previously excluded chapter you'd better hope that none of that is autobiographical. When people think of Cahoon they generally think of her as a surrealist artist and as an occultist. The one fact that everyone knows about her is that she was expelled from the London Surrealist Group in 1940 because of her refusal to curtail her magical interests. She was indeed a scholar of the occult. She had a broad and deep knowledge of the esoteric traditions of both East and West. She was also a working occultist. She was particularly interested in exploring the occult properties of colours. Over the years, she was an active member of an astonishing range of societies and organisations that pursued spiritual interests of one sort or another. Amongst others, she embraced mystical Christianity, Druidry, Goddess Worship, Freemasonry, Theosophy and the Kabbalah. As an artist, she was a prize-winning student at the Slade School of Art and the maker of many memorable images. The one painting by her that most people know is Scylla, which she painted in 1938 and which is now in the Tate collections. If you don't know the paintings, uh, I've brought a folder with some reproductions in it. You can have a look at those later. Scylla is a double image, a classic surrealist technique in which the subject is one thing, but spontaneously, uh, simultaneously it is something entirely different. Look at it for the first time and you see a slender boat navigating its way between two rocky pillars. Look again and you see that the pillars are actually the artist's legs as they appeared to her as she looked down her body as she lay in the bath. The puny phallic boat is about to be crushed between her rocky thighs. In Cahoon's world nothing is as it originally seems. She occupies a place where, as she once put it, the laws of ordinary existence do not apply. She was also a writer. You can make out a strong case that during her life she was more successful as a writer than she was as an artist. Some years ago, when my colleague Mark Morrison and I were preparing a bibliography of her published writings, we ended up with over 120 separate entries against her name. Even now, unknown pieces are still being found. Only two weeks ago, another friend, Marcus Williamson, found four new poems in issues of Anne Treban, the journal of the Druid Order of Brittany. One reason for this drip feed is that she published her work in some of the most unlikely places. I found references to articles she had written for a magazine referred to as The Builder. Knowing that she had been a Freemason, I thought this must be a Masonic journal. You can imagine my surprise when I tracked The Builder down and discovered it was the trade journal for the construction industry. She had written a series of articles on the potential use of frescoes painted the old traditional way in wet plaster in modern buildings. At the other end of the spectrum, she wrote an article that was published in one of the first numbers of Marion Green's Quest magazine. In that article, she outlined her theory that women are more evolved than men because they have one more opening in their body. Of all the reasons she might have chosen for female superiority, that must be one of the most improbable. But she had a well-argued reason for it and I can tell you about it later, if you wish. 
Returning to Goose of Hermogenes, the plot is simple. The narrator is a young woman whose name is never revealed. She journeys to an island where she is imprisoned by her uncle. He is an alchemist. Alchemy can be understood in different ways. To many people, alchemy is the search for material riches or the conquest of death. The uncle is after the second of these fabled goals. He is searching for immortality and he believes that his niece, the narrator, may hold the key. She too is on a quest, but in her case not for immortality or wealth, but for personal growth. In the course of the novel she undergoes many trials. Just as the alchemist's raw materials are tested, purified and strengthened, the heroine is examined and tested psychologically and physically, before emerging as something purer and stronger. Eventually she returns to the mainland and achieves a reconciliation with her father. Like much of the book, the ending is ambiguous. Her father is undoubtedly dead, and she may be too, both having perhaps achieved the second death of the Theosophists. And we leave her as she sets off on a new journey into a golden dawn, not a phrase Cahoon chose at random. The title, Goose of Hermogenes, is an obscure name for the Philosopher's Stone, the transforming substance that leads to immortality, fantastic riches, or perhaps to spiritual enlightenment. So the alchemical setting is immediately clear. If there are any doubts about that, the book itself is structured as an alchemical quest. The chapters are each named after one or another of the stages or processes of alchemical transformation, separation, conjunction, sublimation, and so forth. Even more than that, the stages are also embedded in the decor and furnishings of the uncle's mansion. He has laid out a series of 15 chambers as three-dimensional reconstructions of the 15 engravings that traditionally illustrate the Book of Lambspring, one of the most famous 16th century alchemical treatises. So a journey down his corridor is a journey along the alchemical path. Alchemy was a lifelong obsession for Cahoon. She had been thinking about it since her school days at Cheltenham Ladies College. Illustrations of a fantastical bird labelled the phoenix survive from some of her school exercise books. The phoenix, of course, is the legendary immortal bird that dies in fire and arises from its own ashes. It's a long-standing symbol of alchemical transformation. In 1926, the year after she left school, she wrote a short story and a one-act play, both called The Bird of Hermes. And she also designed bird masks and costumes for the performers. She continued her alchemical interests after she started at the Slade School of Art in 1927. Whilst a student, she published an article on alchemy in The Quest. This is not the Marion Green Journal, but a much earlier one, edited by a former secretary to Helene Blavatsky called GRS Mead, and it was published by John Watkins here in Cecil Court. Her article was well received. The poet, David Gascoigne, who was one of the earliest English writers to take a serious interest in surrealism, later said it was, quotes, one of the best, most stimulating short introductions to the subject of alchemy considered as imaginative literature that exists in English. Anyone moving in artistic circles in the interwar years was bound to come across surrealism sooner or later. It was the most important cultural and artistic movement on mainland Europe. It first made a serious impact on Cahoon in 1936, and that was the year of the International Surrealist Exhibition that first brought surrealism to the attention of the British public. The exhibition was what we would now call a blockbuster. All the leading continental surrealists came over and there was a full programme of supporting events. 
Cahoon was present at the memorable lecture delivered by Salvador Dali. He was encased in a deep sea diver's suit, complete with big brass helmet. All the better for descending into the unconscious, no doubt. His speech was unintelligible and his gestures incomprehensible. Everyone assumed that this was par for the course for a Spanish surrealist delivering a lecture in French but pronouncing it as though it was Spanish, whilst at the same time holding two wolfhounds on a leash in one hand and a billiard cue in the other. But it was also the performance of a man suffocating, as no one had realised that he was without an air supply. A spanner was found and the helmet unbolt unbolted, and Dali was saved. A spanner with precognition might have made itself scarce and saved the world from Dali and his subsequent encounters with Hollywood and kitsch Catholicism. Cahoon was an enthusiastic convert. She was ripe for surrealism because surrealism, like alchemy, questioned the nature of reality and the illusory nature of everyday certainties. She exhibited with the surrealists, but her active involvement with the London Surrealist Group lasted only a matter of months. She was thrown out because she refused to compromise her esoteric interests. This put her in conflict with Edward Messons, the leader of the group, who was very opposed to such matters. Subsequently, her disastrous and short-lived marriage to a Russian-Italian called Tony Del Renzio didn't help. Tony had aspirations to lead the London Surrealists himself and that put him, and therefore her, on a further collision course with Messons. Cahoon's best work occurs when her interest in Surrealism and her, excuse me, her interest in the occult come together. This is true of her paintings and it is true of her writings. It's particularly true of Goose of Homogenes. Extracts from the novel appeared in print in 1939 in the London Bulletin, the journal of the Surrealist group. It was the first piece of fiction of any length that she had written. The only writing she had actually published was the essay on alchemy I mentioned earlier. So it arrived completely out of the blue without any warming up. And like all first novels, it contains the seed of many of the themes that subsequently occur in her writings and her paintings. One of these themes is the idea that women have special magical powers and that these derive from her close alliance with nature. To illustrate this, I'm going to read a passage from Goose of Homogenes. It concerns an ancient pagan goddess named Velanserga, who I think is a, an invention of Cahoon's. The goddess's affinity with nature is such that her body has become merged with the living earth and every part of her is identified with a particular landscape feature. You can't miss the erotic overtones that run through the extract and throughout the book. In this passage, Cahoon describes all the intimate details. At the dark of every moon, Velanserga bleeds. Her quick is hidden by a cloven bud overgrown with root-like tendrils, strawberry red like a huge rose gall. And by day, an intoxicant juice is exuded drop by drop from the grotto below. Above the bush of rootlets, a stem pushes up, with numbers of small tassels sprouting from it like greenish flowers. And by night, this wick gives out an incandescent vapour. The idea that women are intimately connected with nature was a particularly potent one for Cahoon. It lies at the centre of many of her paintings and much of her writings. There is a well-known portrait uh, photograph of Cahoon taken by the American surrealist photographer Man Ray in Paris in the summer of 1939. It's the one that's illustrated on the poster, in fact, where she is clutching a sheaf of wheat. Man Ray didn't keep props in her studio, so if Cahoon wanted to be photographed in a particular pose, she would have had to bring her own accessories. We have to imagine her 
walking through the streets of Paris carrying a sheaf of wheat. Why on earth would she want to have herself photographed in this way? The surrealists were fond of wrenching things from their everyday setting and linking them with apparently unrelated objects to force the viewer to look at things afresh. The portrait appears to be a typical example of just this sort of surrealist incongruity and at a superficial level it is. But the wheat was carefully chosen. She has had herself photographed as a modern Demeter or Ceres, the corn goddess who presides over the fertility of the earth. In other words, she chose to emphasise the close relationship between herself and nature and, by extension, between women in general and nature. The idea that women have a special kinship with nature and the earth is not new. It's found in all periods of history and in many different cultures. In the form that Cahun came to know it, it owes a lot to the writings of a 19th century Frenchman, Eliphas Levi. Levi was a magician who believed that women possess special magical abilities. Perhaps he was evoking memories of the alleged nurturing goddess of prehistory, or perhaps he was a romantic fantasist. But at any rate, it was partly in response to his influence that women began to play significant roles in occult activities that had previously been the preserve of men. There were obviously wider social forces at play as well, including a general reassessment of women and their role in society. Women were especially prominent in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, the leading magical order of the late Victorian and Edwardian per uh, period. In particular, Mina Mathers was particularly explicit and succinct about the magical importance of women. And this is how she put it, quotes, Woman is the magician born of nature by reason of her great natural sensibility and of her instinctive sympathy with such subtle energies as those intelligent inhabitants of the air, the earth, fire and water. And some of you may know Sword of Wisdom, Cahoon's book about Mina's husband, McGregor Mathers, one of the founders of the Golden Dawn. We often talk about Mother Earth, and when we do, we usually mean it as a metaphor, but for Cahoon, it was a literal truth. She was a dyed-in-the-wool animist. She argued that because all matter has been created, even the apparently inanimate, everything must contain a trace of the creator and must be regarded as living. However unlikely this might sound to the modern ear, and however small that vital spark might be, that was what she thought. So, for example, she wrote two topographical books, the one about Ireland is called The Crying of the Wind. The title is to be taken literally, not merely metaphorically. The air is full of spirits and they make their presence heard. Her book about Cornwall is called The Living Stones. Again, the title says it all. The stones are alive. Being alive, the land is naturally sexually active. Many of her paintings show stone circles or feature standing stones. You don't have to be a Freudian to understand the phallic symbolism of the standing stone. Whenever you see a standing stone in Cahoon's art, which is a lot, it's a sure sign that something consensual is going on with Mother Earth. And you won't be surprised to hear that there's a moment in Goose of Hermogenes where the heroine has an intimate moment with a pillar of stone but I'm not going to read that out, you'll have to look it up for yourselves. So much for the relationship between women and the land. What about the relationship between women and men? Does she have anything to say about that in the novel? Quite a lot, it turns out. A theme that runs through the book is the relationship between the genders. There is a constant struggle going on. Physical and mental skirmishes occur between the heroine and her uncle, but the conflict is also existential. Cahoon would like to see the two genders united into one. Perhaps you think that sounds odd, which of course it does, so it needs some explanation. 
It's an idea that has always been popular among certain old-school Christians, of which Cahoon, for all her other spiritual interests, was one. She once wrote an article on the nature of the Old Testament creator God. She argued that the creator is a dual-sexed deity, but the existence of his female side had been suppressed by male-dominated clergy. The original Adam in the Garden of Eden was created in the image of this dual-sexed god, and so he was androgynous. His fall from grace was signified by his splitting into the two separate genders that exist today. Accordingly, redemption can only occur when the duality of gender is transcended. Only then can we return to the state of unity that had existed in paradise. I'm going to read a passage from Goose of Homogenes that deals with gender unification. It recounts the story of two lovers, two cousins, Oriole and Corolla, who have been kept apart by Corolla's devious mother. They escape her clutches by flying out the window and following a great bird towards freedom and unity. At this point we are only halfway through the story and complete unification is only hinted at for the time being. This is what she says. They floated on, gently at first, and more rapidly so as not to lose sight of the bird. As they flew, leaving the mansion and its grounds far behind, they became permeated with light and colour, and their blood, always a single stream, now pulsed back and forth along the rays of the sun as from some magnetic heart. The bird, too, must have felt a link with the fiery west, for it sailed on as though drawn without volition to plunge into that flaming core. And with this creature of air for guide, the two sailed effortlessly on, desiring no return. And if you want to discover their fate, you'll have to read the book. You'll find it in the chapter called Conjunction, which is a bit of a clue. One of the questions I posed at the beginning was this. How far can we identify the narrator with Cahoon herself? How far do her own experiences intrude? She was born in India in 1906, where her father held a senior position in the Indian Civil Service. Before she was two years old, she was brought to the UK by her mother, who then returned to India, leaving Ethel and her younger brother to be brought up by an elderly spinster aunt on the Isle of Wight. You'll notice that just like her heroine, Cahoon was left parentless on an island, although she was looked after by an aunt, not mistreated by an uncle. Cahoon, like her heroine, left the island to be re reunited with her father, uh, in her case on his return from India. So the bald outline of the novel mirrors Cahoon's early experiences. You will have your own views on how far to trust psychobiography, but the parallels are clearly there. Whatever the reasons, islands occupied an important place in Cahoon's imagination. It can hardly be an accident that Cahoon's two completed novels, Goose of Hermogenes and I Saw Water, which she wrote during the 60s, are both set on islands. The plot of her third novel, Destination Limbo, involves a journey to an island where a great psychic battle between two opposing occult societies takes place. That book is probably incomplete, but it's difficult to say. That's the trouble with lim a place like Limbo. You're never quite sure what's going on. Goose of Homogenes contains many examples of what the narrator calls the perpetual terror of the earth and the sea. So, twelve men are found frozen stiff in a stranded lifeboat. What a rich image that is. A submerged cathedral rises from the watery depths. The narrator cuts a vein, allowing a stream of her blood to enter the sea and encircle the island, magically capturing and imprisoning her lover. Her second novel, I Saw Water, was written in the 1960s and it too was set on an island. Most of the action takes place in a convent 
and the dawning realisation by the nuns that they are all dead forms the substance of the plot. The nuns belong to the order of the Parthenogenesists, but everyone has forgotten how Parthenogenesis, which is a kind of asexual reproduction, works. At the climax of that novel, the heroine divests herself of all her possessions, rids herself of her name, disposes of her personality, forgets all her memories and finds peace in the warm sands of the foreshore, the place that belongs to neither land nor water but to them both, the place where she achieves her second death. Goose of Hermogenes is autobiographical in another way and that's because Cahoon incorporated a number of her dreams into the text. A dream is clearly autobiographical in the rather special sense that it is a mental event in the mind of the dreamer. Dreams held a particular significance for Cahoon, as they did for the Surrealists, though for slightly different reasons. For Surrealists, they were important because their content lay beyond conscious control, and Surrealism was all about uncovering layers of thought that were beyond reason and control. Cahoon was happy to go along with this, but she also believed that dreams were of much greater significance. Nowadays, our beliefs about dreams tend to be polarised. Some say that dreams are meaningless, some kind of nocturnal neuronal housekeeping. Others adopt the view of the psychoanalysts that they carry important but coded information about our mental pathology. For her part, Cahoon struck closely to the traditional view that dreams can predict the future. For a period during the 1950s, she was a member of a research group led by a Jungian psychotherapist that attempted to systematically investigate the hypothesis that dreams can predict natural or human disasters. The predictive power of dreams is not an easy position to maintain if you believe that time is linear. This was not a problem for Cahoon, who believed that the future is the present viewed from somewhere else. She also stuck closely to the traditional view that dreams contain messages from the gods. Although it's unfashionable nowadays, this is the view that held sway throughout most of recorded history. She undoubtedly saw herself as a channel through which hidden intelligences could communicate. This is why she kept dream diaries all her adult life and used her dreams in her novels, poems, short stories and magical rituals. Other phenomena, not just dreams, can happen at night. And my final example, and I'm nearly through now, uh, my final example of autobiography concern, concerns ghosts and hauntings. There are places in the book where she describes nocturnal visitations which we know from other writings of hers are based on her own experiences. And perhaps it was these that led her to be unusually sympathetic to the practical difficulties of being a ghost. And here is an example. As an infant has difficulty in believing that it has left the womb, so a new ghost has difficulty in believing that it has left the world. Sometimes the ghost feels, acts, decides as though it was still blown through by the breath of life. It has to remind itself constantly and concentrate its attention upon the fact that it is no longer alive, otherwise hauntings occur. Those ghosts return most persistently who have never known that they were dead. Others come back fitfully when they have known and then again forgotten. When they fully realise it at last, their haunting ceases. A ghost must keep always before it a vision of that end which it has reached and only allow itself to be worked on by the breath of death. And with that uh, solid piece of practical advice, I hope you all sleep well tonight. Thank you. I wrote a book about her which was part biography and part a catalogue of her artwork and partly an um, analysis of her various writings. 
So in, in that sense, yes, but I, I was more interested in cataloguing the artwork and trying to understand what, what her themes are, because it's an, an astonishing body of work, as, as you, you may well know, um, and it's not widely known, and it's not widely seen, and I always feel it needs a better audience. Yeah, well, I came to it through surrealism, I think, really. Uh, her, seeing her name in a surrealist magazine in the 60s when I was still at school, seeing this extraordinary poem, poem uh, signed with this extraordinary name, I thought Cahoon, and I thought the whole thing was just a big surrealist joke. I didn't think she existed at all, but of course I was wrong. And then later on, I, actually, I went to see her with, with uh, Denise, my wife, and we... Uh, bought paintings from her and so forth and uh, and that was sort of the start of it and it's gradually taken over. What was she like? <laughs> um, well I think there were two sides to her really. On the, she, as a product of Cheltenham Ladies College, she had all the social graces as you might expect and people always describe her as being a very sociable, witty, amiable, intelligent woman. Um, but at the same time, they always describe her also as being an astonishingly difficult woman. And I think that was because in order to succeed in what was, succeed in what was still essentially a male art-dominated world, you had to have a lot of um, conviction that what you were doing was right. And also, I think in the magical world, too, that she was extremely precise about her magical researches. Um, she regarded magic really as a precise science, I think, rather than something kind of uh, airy-fairy and something e ephemeral. And she was, she was extraordinarily critical of numerologists, for example, where the numbers didn't quite match up but it sounded like it ought to be okay. She thought that just wasn't on at all. And I think she made herself very difficult from that point of view. Um, and I think that's why she was refused entry to a number of the magical societies she attempted to join. But they saw that she was trouble, she was difficult, she wouldn't compromise. As far as we know, as far as we know, she was, she was initiated into a number of different groups. She worked with Kenneth Grant in the OTO in the early 50s, and her magical diaries from that period still survive, and she describes some of the rituals and she, that she invented, developed, I perhaps should say, she describes... Um, the uh, course of study which she had to undergo. She was a member of uh, druidical organisations and they had a set study course as well. She had to do a set number of what they called groves um, in order to uh, advance through the, uh, the ranks of, 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 of druidry. So yes, she was a, she was a um, practicing magician and magic is essentially is a group experience isn't it? it's a sharing thing but of course she isolated herself in the far southwest of England where none of that was probably open to her um, she was she lived in a small cottage just outside of Penzance artistically isolated probably magically isolated regarded by the locals as a complete eccentric um, and ploughed her lonely furrow there, I think, and went to her grave believing that she was severely underrated, and I think she was absolutely right. The school of modern, modernist art was in St Ives, um, but, and there was a smaller school in, in Penzance, but it was very different, and the, the two, I think, as artistic and magic groups always are, at loggerheads with, with each other, and so I'd, I'd, I don't even know that they would have met. Yeah. I think her druid... Um, associations were more in Brittany than in, in, in Cornwall. She, I know she went to various druidic pardons, I think they were called, in Brittany, and was initiated into a, a, a Brittany order. Um, but there's photographs of her parading up Parliament Hill in her druidic robes as well. So. Yeah, but mostly I think she was uh, intellectually and physically fairly isolated in Cornwall. Um, when she, in her will, she bequeathed her studio contents to the National Trust, um, with the exception of a small number of paintings which she bequeathed to the Tate, but nobody knew which they were. 
And so in the end, they had to settle by arbitration. They had to get an arbiter in to uh, decide which paintings ought to go to the Tate. And the Tate ended up with about 40 or 50 of her most extraordinarily magical works. And they are in the, uh, the archives at Tate Britain, where you can easily see them, although you do have to make an appointment in order to do so. The rest of her work, over 3,000 pieces, varying from um, childhood scribbles to completed artworks, is in the possession of the National Trust. They have always been an embarrassment to the National Trust, I think, which is an expert in formal gardens and Georgian furniture. They know nothing about occult surrealism, and so they've just kept them and not done anything with them. Um, and it's only very recently that uh, people have been able to look at them. Um, my book was based on days of photographing all the uh, works there. Um, Robert Ansell's tarot pack, which you have here, the tarot cards. And then, have you sold the deck out of intelligence as well? Perhaps not. Perhaps that was just a limited edition. But yeah, they're, they're all owned by the National Trust as well. So they're all, the, most of them are in two places. One is the Tate. The second is the National Trust, and the third place is my house. <laughs> but that collection is considerably smaller. <laughs> in in Sword of Wisdom, her book about McGregor Mathers, she there's a big long autobiographical passage in that, and she dates it from reading about Crowley and the Abbey at Kefalo. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. She was very secretive about a lot of the origin of her ideas and her activities and she often says incompatible things um, which don't don't add up and so it, it isn't really she always had a mystical view of the world she could always see fairies from a young age um, i think she i think it was an inborn attitude towards the world kind of encouraging that? No, no. Um, I don't think they were discouraging of her artistic interests, but I think they found her interest in the occult was very strange. Um, as indeed, most people would find it very strange. An awful lot of her imagery is sexual imagery. There's an awful lot of genitalia in her um, work. And there's letters from her mother saying, I do wish you'd give all that up. You've overdone that a bit, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> and Dad, I suppose, was, he was, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing, but uh, he, was, he was a senior figure in the Indian civil service. Uh, he was deputy commissioner of a large part of northern India. Can't imagine he was too enamoured of all that. But uh, I, I really, that's just a guess. I've, I've, I've really no idea. So it's Gerald Gardens. So yes, well, she knew him. She, I think she knew everybody uh, uh, to some extent. But um, knew Austin Spare, knew... Uh, but went off to Cornwall perhaps because she found the atmosphere there more congenial. Um, she was certainly a lifelong asthma sufferer and I think she found the air down there a lot better as well. Yeah, I just finished a novel about an hour ago. So oh, you've read it, have you? Yeah. Yeah. I enjoy reading it, though. I don't really know what it's about. No, <laughs> no. It's, a lot of it is dreams strung together, with, and she's provided a kind of narrative structure. And dreams, by their very nature, have logical leaps and yeah. uh, jumps in time and place and so on. And I think that accounts for the odd atmosphere. But I think it's I think it's well written. She has a tendency oh, to overuse adjectives a bit, um, but uh, yeah, I think you can actually follow it, and if you can, you can pick up the themes that occur in her other works as well. Her second novel, I Saw Water, is much harder to understand, I think, because that is more or less pure dream narrative, with, with a few linking names and so on, and as as because. The heroine is dead and she's undergoing this kind of metamorphosis and losing her body and her personality and her memory and so on. And so the, the, um, the, uh, the structure of the narrative becomes incoherent and loose to reflect that. And that really is very odd. And the third one is, well, <laughs> may or may not be finished, who knows. <laughs>